We love you. Oh, man. Here I am in the borough of my birth in Brooklyn. And, and as Peter was saying, thank you, Peter and Rebecca, for all you do, for the words that you said. And it's, it is pretty surreal. The last time I was here was in 2019. I, I, and I think I was, that was famous for me almost stage diving. Uh, I'm not going to do it because I can't get hurt. I got to stay out here on the campaign trail. <laughs> Um, but it is so good to be here in Brooklyn. Um, my, my sister is here, ja Jamie and her family, um, also born in Brooklyn. So um, this is a family reunion, but this is also, we got our whole family involved in this campaign for Kamala because just like she is always there for our family, she is going to be there for your family. How about that debate last week? It's so funny. So right now, we are both hustling around the country. We barely get to see each other. We don't have a lot of this like special couple time that we are known for that sometimes when we're around Ellen and Cole, they're like, yeah, God. But um, we did have a special moment uh, right before the debate. We were in Pittsburgh. She was getting ready. And they gave us like an hour off to take a quote unquote romantic walk together. <laughs> and that romantic walk happened to be on a tarmac of a airbase. Uh, you might have seen a video of it. And so like everything in our life right now, there's a lot of people, a lot of press around. And so we're walking and we're trying to be normal and we're joking around. And then there's all this press around the corner. They're shouting questions at her. And I, are you ready? And she just like stopped and gave one of those Kamala looks <laughs> that we know so well, right, Ella? And the world knows. And she said, I'm ready. <laughs> so uh, it turns out she was. And um, I, I just, I think back to one of those rallies that she's done. Um, where she said, uh, you, you know, they're throwing so much shit at her right now. It's pretty incredible. But well, so what did she say at one of those rallies? She said, hey, you got something to say? Yeah. Say it to my face. Hey. So there they are on the debate stage. And this was, of course, right after. I, I try to reenact this. She And this, this guy didn't know what to do. He like put his hands in his pockets. He was completely, had, and she said, hi, I'm Kamala Harris. Have a great debate. Um, so, you know, she had said, say it to my face, say it to my face. Okay, so there they are on the debate stage. He's like four or five feet away from her. And he has this opportunity now to say something right to her face. And guess what? He did not look at her one time. He didn't have the courage to even look her in the eye to all that stuff he's tweeting and truth socialing and saying at these rallies. He could not say one thing right to her face. She did not have that problem, however, because she had no problem looking right him right in the eye, pointing at him. And what did she say? She said, you are a disgrace. She said, your own generals, world leaders are laughing at you. And why did she say that? Because it's true. He is unfit, unfit for any job. Would you hire him for anything? unfit for any job, let alone to be president of the United States ever again. So there's a lot of incoming right now. Just it's hard to keep up. Just in the last day or so, we've had some pretty terrible stuff coming our way. Um, you know, the latest hit on Kamala, did you see what they said? 
And this one is unbelievable. They said that somehow because Cole and Ella aren't Kamala's quote unquote biological children, that she doesn't have anything in her life to keep her humble. As if keeping women humble, whether you have children or not, is something we should strive for. It is not. But I'll tell you what, going back to that debate, Kamala sure kept Trump humble at that debate, didn't she? Because that's what this is really about. And there is nothing, there is nothing more important to me, Kamala, and Kirsten than our kids, our big, beautiful, blended family. And we know that all parents, no matter how you become one, make the same sacrifices and revel in the same joys of raising children as any parent anywhere. But none of this really affects Kamala. Everything just bounces off of her. And I think we should all follow her advice, which she gives to me every single day, which is get back out there, because we got to win. And don't be distracted, because so much of this nonsense is to distract us, because we know what they're really trying to do. It's Dobbs. It's Project 2025. It's spreading hate and trying to pit women against each other, trying to pit us all against each other. That's what they're trying to do here. But I've got news for him. The women in this country are sick and tired of weak men trying to take away their fundamental rights. And then, and then gaslight you about it. We're sick and tired of it. And the women in this country will never humble themselves before Donald Trump. And Kamala will make sure that nobody falls for this constant gaslighting, this constant lying, trying to make us not see what is right in front of our eyes. You saw it yesterday when she took on the sick and dangerous lies that they are making about Haitian migrants in Springfield, Ohio. She called out the little sidekick, J.D. Vance, for his cynical fabrication intentionally designed to terrorize a community. And he knows it's a lie. He's admitted it's a lie, but he doesn't care. This is who they are. And this is in his own state. He's a senator from Ohio, for God's sakes. They know it's false. They knew it was false before Trump brought it up at the debate, but they keep lying about it. They keep lying about it. That was in my remarks, because that's all they have. Do you want to be uh, help me write these speeches? That's pretty good, because that is all they have. Good job. <laughs> so, J.D., J.D. Vance, my goodness. What is his obsession with cats? <laughs> He's worried about women who own them and makes up stories about people eating them. It's bizarre, JD. Well, it, it's ex he's an extremist and a misogynist. Let's just call it out. So if they are so scared of women rising up, maybe they shouldn't have taken so many steps to put women's lives at risk. So Ella's here. I love you, Ella. But I I'm going to take you back. I'm going to take you back a couple of years to the day the Dobbs decision came out. Um, I got a call from uh, my wife, Kamala, the vice president. <laughs> Uh, it's still really fun to say that. Uh, she was on Air Force Two because she is vice president. And, but the decision came out, and this is where it gets serious. And she called me right when it came out. And she was enraged, like, like you all were. And she called and said, Dougie, because she can call me Dougie. Um, but Dougie, they actually did it. And we knew we had the, 
the decision had leaked out, but she had said, Dougie, they actually did it. And that rage that she had, that anger that you all had, she turned that into action for these past years, and she will continue to act on that. But my dear, darling daughter, Ella, who um, usually texts me about dad stuff when she texts. She does. She's actually good about it. She's great about it. But what Ella, if you remember what you texted me this day, um, right after, I got this text right after Kamala called, horrible, horrible, horrible day. Time to fight. I'm angry and I don't want to stand by silently. We must do something about this. This was right to me. And then my mother, Barb, um, who you might have met my mother at the convention. But my mom was upset, too, because women of her generation, her included, they were out fighting for equal rights in the 60s and early 70s. They were the ones fighting for these abortion rights that were codified in Roe v. Wade. And so for her reaction was, how is it possible? How is it possible that now a woman in her 80s who had enjoyed all these rights and her generation had fought for these rights and then her beloved granddaughter would now somehow have less rights than she would have? Same thing. You got to go out and fight and do something about this. So, but we've now seen this hellscape that Dobbs has unleashed. Women are dying. Women are actually dying. And so when the decision says, oh, women are, are not without power, they can just go to the states and, and work it out. And that was Trump on the debate stage. Yeah, that's not working. Because the extreme bans, many without exceptions, many which have criminal penalties for doctors as well, it's, it's killing women. It's also driving medical professions, professionals from the profession. Women are not getting the urgent care and other care that they need when there are no doctors uh, performing these services. So it is a full-blown crisis. You've seen the stories. And then back to the little sidekick, abortion, no abortion, no exceptions. No abortion, no exceptions. So one, can you imagine, like we saw the story of the, we just put out a video of a, of a young woman who had been raped and, and was impregnated by her stepfather. And that, you're saying that? girl has no agency about what happens next after a violent crime was committed, this is immoral. This is barbaric. And this will change when Kamala Harris is president of the United States. So we already know what they want to do. It's Dobbs and Project 2025. That's what they're trying to do. And it's, it's 900 plus pages. It's all in there as much as, again, the gaslighting. What, Project 25? I've never met that person. That was him on the debate. <laughs> Come on. We know what the game is. Because you remember the debate? He said, oh, uh, I, uh, would, he would not commit to vetoing a national abortion ban. Why is that? Because he wants a national abortion ban. That's what's coming our way. Freedoms are at risk, and it is not just abortion rights. In that opinion, in that horrific Dobbs opinion, Justice Thomas said in the concurring opinion, what else can we come after that's based on the right of privacy? That's contraception. That's the right to love who you want to love, marry who you want to marry, and do what you want to do uh, without the government interfering with your rights, and that is what's happening. IVF is under attack. There was a bill in front of them. Oh, we're, we're pro-IVF. They all voted against it. Uh, it's gaslighting. It's infuriating. You should be pissed off right now. So as, as Ella knows, my, one, of my, one of my mottos for myself to get myself fired up, I did a lot of sports. I was a courtroom lawyer. I approach everything the same way and that is to stay mad. <laughs> stay mad, and, uh, and why? Because you can channel that, that anger into action. Because right now, with what they're trying to do, what's already happening with Dobbs, and what they've said they're gonna do, we gotta be pissed off. And we gotta turn that into action 
turn that into action, get registered, and vote. And we got to stay focused. What I said earlier, all, they're just, all the name calling, the, the gaslighting, it's just a distraction. It's discipline and focus. Discipline and focus. Just this morning, we're having our coffee. Really? Is my mother here? <laughs> um, and, and she has really helped me find my way as second gentleman. Um, it was a little abrupt to, to be a lawyer for 30 years doing something I, I love so much. I was an entertainment lawyer in Hollywood. That was my dream. I was good at it. I loved it. Uh, the, in the video that uh, Cole put together, you had some Doug lawyer content. Um, but she, she's the one who pushed me to use this microphone and, and find some issues where you as one, the first guy ever, to be a White House principal. So talk about gender equity. And that's what I have been doing. Pay equity, family leave, childcare, reproductive freedom, all these things that matter. And it's not as if some guy somewhere is failing if some woman is succeeding. It doesn't work that way. It's not a zero sum game. When women succeed, we all succeed. And I'm the first Jew ever to be in this role. And she said, there's a lot of hate out there, so go fight hate. And that's what I've been doing with her, with her backing and her push. And I'll keep doing that as first gentleman. So Kama has shown us that she's tough. She's had a career of being tough. She's had a career of solving problems. She talked about her upbringing, child of, of two immigrants who came to seek the American dream, raised by a single mother, uh, worried about how they were going to pay the bills, a lot of discussions around that kitchen table. She learned a lot from her mother. And her mother would always tell her, though, don't complain. Do not complain about things. Go out and solve those problems. So Kamala Harris, she sees a problem, solves a problem. That's right, and that's been her mantra. And how she started out, she told that story about her best friend in high school who was being molested by her stepfather. And she invited that friend to live with them. Again, doing the things to protect us, to protect her friend, and that's what got her into becoming a prosecutor to protect victims of crime. And as a prosecutor, she put away the worst of the worst, murderers, rapists, sex offenders. And she never asked them, and she, she mentioned this, are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? The only thing she cared about is, are you okay? And that's how she's approached her public service through her tenure as our attorney general in California when I went on that fateful blind date. She was first term attorney general when we celebrated our 10 year anniversary in front of the world when she gave her acceptance speech to the DNC. She went from attorney general where she took on transnational gangs at the border. She beat the big banks when they were uh, defrauding consumers during the, the mortgage crisis. She shut down for-profit schools that were scamming people who just wanted an education. This is who she is. And then as a U.S. Senator, she continued that work for four years in the Senate, uh, pushing things like maternal health care, uh, which be got done when she was vice president. And then when she became vice president, um, you know, what, one of the most annoying things we, we heard is her family, because we all see the work she's doing is, where's Kamala? What's she doing? Like, are you kidding me? She's doing a lot as vice president in the Oval Office with the president, helping make some of the hardest decisions in the Situation Room, dealing with some of the thorniest national security issues and on the world stage. She talked about it at the debate, being in Ukraine, being all over the place, showing that mastery, showing that she is ready to be commander in chief day one. She's also leading on gun violence. She is head of the Gun Violence Prevention Office. 
I talked about all the work she's doing on Dobbs and reproductive freedom and just freedom in general. Um, she's leading on space, on AI, and there's a big long list. I'm not going to go through it. Trust me. She's doing a lot, and she's going to continue to do that when she's president. And on the economy, she's going to continue all the great work that they've done in the Biden-Harris administration on infrastructure. Remember, Trump talked about infrastructure week that never happened. Biden-Harris got it done. That's going to continue and expand in her term as president. Uh, this is rebuilding. You see, I travel all over the country, rebuilding our roads, our bridges and tunnels. That's kind of a funny thing to say here. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm from the borough. I, get, I can say that. And, um, and broadband, it's working. Uh, we need more housing in this country. She's got a plan for 3 million new houses, affordable housing, $25,000 down payment assistance. That's huge. $6,000 child tax credit. And we need more small business. So $50,000 tax credit is massive because we know it costs more than the current 5000 to open a new business. So this is all going to continue to build jobs, this transition that she talked about to a clean energy economy, the CHIPS Act, the CHIPS coming here. All this stuff is going to continue to have our economy jam. And, that, and she gets it. Thank you. That's right. Real stuff for real people. That's what that's what she's doing. Um, the, the, she said a few things day one when um, President Biden uh, decided not to continue his campaign, and we needed somebody to step up. We needed somebody to jump into the breach, and she's the one who stepped up. Yeah. And she told us all. She told us all that the day after in Wilmington, she said, "One, I'm going to earn the nomination." She said, two, I'm going to unite the Democratic Party. But she, hold on, but she also said, three, I'm going to unite the country. And then four, she said, I'm going to be the next president of the United States. But if you go back to that checklist, one, she earned the nomination. One A, she picked a great vice presidential candidate in Tim Walls. Two, she united the Democratic Party. Three, she is uniting the country as we speak. And if you see some of the endorsements that we're getting uh, from AOC all the way to Dick Cheney, this is a big tent here. And just today, we had like 111 Republican, these are leaders in, in national security, generals, and others. They're all coming behind Kamala. Why is that? Because she's talking about a country that we all have a place in. She's talking about the future. She's doing it with joy. She's doing it with, dare I say, laughter. And she's doing it with vision, where everyone can have a place. And she's also doing it in a way where we will have a country, where we will have a democracy, where we honor the rule of law, and we honor each other. And we're leaders who lift people up, not just trying to beat them down all the time. And people are just sick of it. They're just sick of it. They want good, positive leadership. And that's what we're going to get with Kamala and Tim. Now, look, we got 48 days. We don't got a lot of time left. But the good news is the map is wide open. The map is wide open. I was in Florida. I was at the Villages a few days ago. There were, there were golf carts and people everywhere. There's excitement everywhere I go, including red states. Because people are getting this. This is why you're hearing the USA chants at her rallies. This is why you're, you're getting the calls and responses on everything that she's saying. Because people want this. They want this leadership. So, so how do we win? How, that's right. And how do, we, how do we get this done? One, we got to continue raising money. we got to continue raising money. Because the more money we raise, the more we can compete in these seven, maybe eight, maybe more states, and compete hard, compete on, in the field, on the ground, with offices and the hundreds of thousands of volunteers who are giving up their time because they care about this country. They're patriots. They love their country. Two, we got to get everyone to register. I loved when Taylor Swift endorsed her right after the debate. 
But what Taylor did in that really great letter, if you haven't re read the whole letter, because she said, I've done my homework. She had all these great reasons, but then she said, you've got to go out and register. So there's vote.org, vote.gov, IWillVote.com. There's a, lots of ways to do it. Look it up. Just get everyone to register, and then we got to bring everyone out to vote. So we got a lot of new folks. We got a lot of young people, people in college. Pe make sure everyone has a registration strategy and a voting strategy, because each state, unfortunately, has different rules. And in some of these states, they're trying to mess us up because see everything I said earlier about how terrible they are, because they don't have good ideas. So they're going to try to do all this stuff. So let's not let them do it. Let's do it. Michelle Obama said two, two great things. She said, one, do something. But she also said that we, we have to vote in numbers that erase any doubt because we need to overwhelm any effort to suppress us. Why? Because we know they're going to do that. So let's get out there and do it. You have an incredible candidate, somebody who is out there She's exceeding incredibly high expectations and massive pressure. Look at how she stepped up in July. Look at how she stepped up at the convention. Look at how she stepped up at that debate. So she's going to continue to be the best, most badass version of Kamala Harris right through the end of this election. So we all need to be the most badass versions of ourselves so we can help her become the next president of the United States. Well, well, hold, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Um, Brooklyn's favorite son, Spike Lee, wants to come out and say a few words. Spike. basketball tonight but we're gonna kick the Celtics ass bro. all right thank you for this honor I've never done this before but my daughter introduced the vice president here when she was running for the president of the United States so shout out to my daughter Satchel where you at I'm gonna make this quick I'm gonna make this quick. Let's start out right. Is Brooklyn in the house? My man was born in Brooklyn. Is Brooklyn in the house? Coney Island. Sheep's Head Bay. Bed Stuy, do or die. Where you at? Brooklyn Heights. And what about the great Fort Greene? Is Fort Greene here? I want to thank. All right, we can't name every neighborhood in Brooklyn. Can't do it. I'm not doing that. But I want Dougie Doug. That's Dougie Doug. We have one of many things in common. The biggest thing is. We're married to two strong sisters. <laughs> Will you admit this? Sometimes too strong. <laughs> anyway, we got to register to vote. And we can't go for the okie doke. You've all seen it. You can't go to the three card money. You can't win doing the three card money. We have, we know what's real and what's fake. We can't go for that, for the subterfuge, shenanigans, and skullduggery. We can't go for the okie doke. We know what it is. And I, I wrote a film called Do the Right Thing. And my brother, Ray Rahim had love rings 
One said love. One said hate. I didn't make that up. That comes from a film called Night of the Hunter. Robert Mitchum had those things, love and hate, tattooed on his fingers. But I'm in film school. They showed me that. I'm saying I'm using it. <laughs> we cannot go for the okie doke. This thing is going to be close. And you know I'm a big sports fan. And I've seen too many games. I'm not going to name what teams here in New York. <laughs> where we thought the game was won. Until the buzzer, the whistle is still, is game on. We know what this guy does. We do not want to see a motherfucker rerun of January 6th. No rerun. And like my brother Bamba said, usually the reruns aren't as good as the first film. So, last thing. We've raised tonight here in the People's Republic of Brooklyn, New York, half a million dollars. Is Brooklyn in the house? Yeah. Loud, is Brooklyn in the house? Yeah. All right.